thank you everybody for coming here. I'm Mehmo Sanjuani. Um, and I have just an amazing honor to have uh, Dr. Azra Raza here today. Uh, everybody knows her. Um, and um, it's just very strange that uh, I first found out about Azra as a poet uh, because I'm part of an American Pakistan organization and she was uh, during COVID, there were lots of Zoom sessions, and that's how I got exposed to her. And I go, oh, wow, what an interesting Pakistani person. She's an amazing poet. And then only later on, I found out, like, oh, that's her evening job. Or <laughs> her, passion. her actual day job is that she's a, she's a, uh, she's a cancer, world's foremost cancer authority. Uh, and I'm like, you know, how, how blessed are we to have somebody like her? And then she was going to come here, and she said, you know, maybe I should meet with some people, and I said, why not? So I called uh, Junaid, and, and Junaid called Afra and Shama Khan, and here we are. So welcome, everybody. I don't want to take any more time. Thank you for all being here, and uh, Azrafa, welcome. And Afra, please take it over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mehmood. First of all, I wanted to thank you and Open for being generous hosts for hosting me and giving me the honor of uh, hosting someone so special and remarkable. So welcome, Azra, um, Appa, and uh, we will start the evening with um, a share that I want to read in your honor to welcome you. It's not my own share, although I do write Urdu poetry, but this is something that I um, chose for you. Tum jo aai ho to shakle daro diwar hai aur. Tum jo aai ho to shakle daro diwar hai aur. Kitni rangin meri sham hui jati hai. Wow. <laughs> so we will start the evening with that. Um, I am a medical professional by uh, profession. I'm an internal medicine physician, currently working as a medical director at a, at a health AI company. Um, and what do I say for your introduction? There's so many accolades and achievements. A physician, a scientist, an author, a poetry enthusiast, um, professor of Medicine and Clinical Director of the Myelodysplastic Center and Executive Director of the First Cell Coalition at Columbia University. Recipient of several awards and I started reading them and I was like, we're going to be here all night if I read all the list. <laughs> so I will spare everybody that. Um, also, um, the author of The First Cell and The Human Cost of uh, Pursuing Cancer to the Last, a bestseller. And um, we actually have some copies today that she has signed that we'll be giving away. Also a co-author of a book, Ghalib, which is um, a collection of the works of the famous Urdu poet. And I just found out, uh, you know, researching about you on this, that we both share that love of Ghalib and his poetry. Um, and you've also published numerous uh, scientific articles. So like I said, you know, it could take all night reading yeah. all the introductions. So we will, um, I, I'm sure that everybody here is uh, looking forward to hearing from you. So we'll um, start with that. So welcome and thank you for making time for us. Okay, I think it's good now. Can everyone hear us in the back? Yes. Okay, thank you. So my first question to you is, um, how did you get inspiration uh, in poetry? Can you tell us about that? Like, how did you get inspired to start reading and reciting and memorizing poetry? Um, well, um, let me start by thanking uh, Mahmood Panjwani for organizing this whole thing. I'm so delighted to be here with all of you. And especially grateful to Ifra for being my interlocutor. Not an easy job, I'm sure. Uh, how did my interest in poetry begin? I think it's a matter of uh, being raised in an environment where no conversation was ever complete without one of my parents reciting a shir. Oh. 
and from as far back as I remember growing up, it was always uh, a culture of an oral tradition where we were made to memorize the great classic poets like Ghalib and Anis and Mir and Iqbal. And so because I was raised in that tradition and could recite hundreds of verses already, as I grew older and began to understand some of it, I realized that I have to dive deeper because they were so beautiful. Urdu is such a seductive language. I mean, to think of the way you can express yourself in Urdu and then the cultural context that gave birth to this language is so nuanced and so uh, subtle, so delicate, such a beautiful culture, such a beautiful language. So I was like completely ravished, except I didn't understand enough. So at the ripe old age of 28, I was living in Buffalo, New York, doing my fellowship in oncology. I started having, just collecting a few friends in the evening and started something I called Urdu Mehfil where we would read a ghazal of Ghalib and I had 11 sharas around me that had the interpretations of the ghazal. We would read from all of them and then read again and again. So every evening, uh, every time we met in an evening, we would complete one ghazal. Do you know that over the next 20 years, I read the entire Diwan twice with the sharas? And then, you know, the shocking thing is that what occurred to me was that these 11 sharas are not doing justice to Ghalib because I can come up with a new one. And if you allow, I'll give an example. Absolutely. I don't want my answers to become so belabored and so long. That's fine. But we don't mind. <laughs> We're here to listen to you. You know, there's a beautiful share of Ghalib, for example, from that ghazal, Ibn Maryam hua kare koi, mere dukh ki dawa kare koi, kaun hai jo nahi hai hajat man, kis ki hajat rawa kare koi. Then he comes to this gorgeous share, kya kiya khizr ne sikandar se. What did khizr do to sikandar? So first of all, what does that mean? There's an apocryphal legend that uh, the prophet Khizr was looking for the elixir of immortality and he set out on the journey to find this plant which would make him immortal. On the way he meets Alexander the Great and some people say Cyrus the Great. Anyway, he meets Alexander who was looking for the same thing so they join forces and start looking. But uh, there's a dark and stormy night and they get separated. And as a result, Khizr goes and finds the plant and imbibes it and becomes immortal. So when you lose your way, even today, Khizr, our prophet Khizr is the universal guide. He shows you the way. Agar koi rasta bhool jaye, to Khizr ko yaad karte hain But Ghalib is saying, kya kiya Khizr ne sikandar se, which means look at Khizr. He went, found the thing, imbibed it, and has become immortal. And poor Alexander died at the age of 32. (laughs) Kya kiya Khizr ne sikandar se. Look what even a prophet can do to a king. And then the second line is, kya kiya Khizr ne sikandar se. Ab kise rehnuma kare koi. And in the 11 sharas I read, the meaning that it took out was um, you can't depend even on a prophet. They can let you down. So the only person you can depend on is yourself. This was the classic interpretation, except I felt that that is too tacky. That's too ordinary. (laughs) Ghalib would never say something that ordinary, like depend on yourself. I mean self-reliance. That's something. Uh, Emerson would say, (laughs) his essay on (laughs) self-reliance, yes, but not Ghalib, Ghalib is too subtle. So you know the meaning I came up with, with my co-author, Sara Suleri Goodyear and I, and this is why I undertook the the interpretation of Ghalib, because I felt that there there are many ways of interpreting the same thing, and the way I then 
فائنڈ اے نیو میننگ ان دس شیر از کیا کیا خزر نے سکندر سے اب کسے رہنما کرے کوئی ان فیکٹ واٹ غالب از سینگ از دیٹ دا مومنٹ یو اسٹارٹ تھنکنگ دیٹ یو نو دی آنسر اینڈ بیکم کمپلیسنٹ اینڈ سیلف سیٹسفائڈ اینڈ ریلائنٹ آن یور سیلف جسٹ ریمبر لک واٹ خزر ڈیڈ ٹو الیگزینڈر یو کین بی مس لیڈ دا سیم وے سو ڈو ناٹ ڈپینڈ ایون آن یور سیلف کانسٹنٹلی کویسچن یور سیلف In fact, it's the opposite meaning to me of what others had interpreted. It's not that you should depend on yourself. It's when you think you are too satisfied to depend on yourself. Remember, kya kiya khizr ne sikandar se, who the hell are you to depend on yourself? You need guides. You need all the time, you need to keep getting better and better. So as a scientist, and you are one, As a scientist, it's a very important lesson to constantly be skeptical, to question everything, even to yourself. When you think you know the answer, question yourself. And that's why I felt like, okay, a lot of people have interpreted Ghalib, but someone like me who's an oncologist, who's a scientist, who doesn't have the traditional scholarly background in Urdu, yet I'm finding a new meaning in him. So the way we interpreted it is, it is the loss of an internal compass that Ghalib is really cautioning you about. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I think that brings me to my next question. Um, when we were talking and preparing for this interview, you um, said something that I thought was a very important topic. What is our role in society as individuals? And how does the poetry that you have read has inspired that, your perspective on that? I think the role and responsibility of every human being is to reduce the suffering of others. That is our role in society. And the way you can do it best is to have empathy, to be able to stand in the shoes of others and imagine what they are going through. Only then can you help them. That means you develop empathy. And to do that, nothing better than poetry. <laughs> and, and I think as an oncologist, I'm sure a hematologist, that is something All the that time, yes. All the time, yes. How do you keep going? So hard. Not at all. It's a privilege to be able to help people. I don't find it, uh, I mean, uh, heart is a, dif is a kind of uh, uh, vague word, but in reality, there is so much nobility to observe in people who are actually facing issues of mortality, which is right there in front of them, and to see them react with supreme dignity is a privilege. And to be able to play any role in making that journey easier for them. I can't say it's hard. I'll say that it is uh, an empowering Uh, role. So I read somewhere you had mentioned about when you were younger, when you just started your career, um, you had poetry helped you somewhat in interpreting when you had so many different stories from patients and families and how did you make sense of all of that? Can you share a little bit about that? Yes. So. When I was a younger physician, I was constantly plagued by an anxiety. The anxiety was that here is a patient who has come with, let's say, his wife, his children, and is sitting across from the table with me. And the patient is telling me his story about how this illness came about. But then the wife will say, no, no, and she'll interrupt and say something. Then the children will say, so, so the same narrative 
keeps changing from mouth to mouth. Then from week to month, it's a different story. And then my anxiety was, how do I, how do I now transfer what I'm hearing from the patient and the family? How do I accurately reflect it in the patient's chart in such a way that the next doctor who's going to read my note really understands? In other words, narration is a very important part of medicine. And the thing that constantly plagued me was, what am I missing? What am I not hearing? What are they not saying? And so you have to train yourself, you know, like the blind. The blind can hear more hearingly. Their power of hearing increases as they have lost the power of sight. So I'm saying, as a doctor, you need to develop your power of hearing. And then to be able to interpret, record. And so poetry came in very became very helpful because think poetry two lines of a ghazal, of a shair are like the two strands of dna there is a macrocosm of information that is on those two pieces those two strands minute strands they contain whole universes of information the same way two lines of a ghazal it's a macrocosm inside a ma microcosm so in other words, you have to learn to read between the lines. You have to interpret. You have to think about what this really is. What does the poet really mean? Like the kya kya khizr ne sekandar se. Easy to just go, go ahead and, you know. But Mir, Mir is a beautiful poet who cautions us against this by saying, Sar sari tum jahan se guzre. What a gorgeous word is sar sari superficial you have passed through life in a superficial way sar sari tum jahan se guzre varna kya baat hai subhanallah what a learned audience <laughs> sar sari tum jahan se guzre varna har ja jahan e digar tha every place was a new universe in itself you just have to open your eyes and look. Reading, let's say, this share, you think about so many things. And so for me, narrative medicine and poetry became synonymous in a way. That the way you need to train yourself to hear more hearingly is the best way to do it is by reading poetry and interpreting it and reading Urdu poetry. Because I read a lot of English poetry also. And in fact, earlier at uh, Mahmood's office, uh, I recited one of Emily Dickinson's things, which is beautiful. And since we are talking about speaking to patients, let me recite that or another one. Emily Dickinson says, and she was a contemporary of Ghalib, exact same time, they are living oceans apart. Tell all the truth. Her first instruction to you is that when you're talking to, let's say, I'm sitting across the table from a patient who has just been diagnosed with cancer. How do I tell them what they have? How do I tell them what is their prognosis? Well, tell all the truth, she says. But tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. Like lightning to the children, eased with explanations kind, the truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. <laughs> she begins by saying, that, tell all the truth, and ends by saying, <laughs> So, Reading poetry really helps you with at every step of the way it helped me in medicine in so many things. But Urdu poetry especially because no one writes that easily in Urdu, none of the great poets. You really have to shed your blood, sweat and tears to understand. I mean, like I said, I read Ghalib for 20 years from so m literally so many sharas and still I feel like every time we read Ghalib and let me give you one more example my co-author Sara Suleri and I 
after we finished our book of interpreting Ghalib, just 21 ghazals, we couldn't do more because even that took us three years. Uh, we were invited by the Harvard group to give a, uh, to, to submit an essay on translations of Ghalib, what did we do? And we could do more shares. I said to Sarah, you know, it's been a few years since we did our book. Let's just pluck a few shares from what we did from different ghazals and not go back and read what the way we interpreted it. But let's reinterpret today. So what we did it, we, we picked 11 shares from different sharas. We didn't read our book because, you know, you don't remember exactly what you'd written, though we had a general sense. Can you believe it, guys, that seven out of those 11 shares, what we came up with this time was completely different. <laughs> so even we ourselves interpreted the same share in a different way. And that's the beauty of Urdu poetry, that there's so many things that you can uh, unearth from it. It's, it's just fabulous. So it's a lifelong journey for me. I love it. I really admired one of the lines in um, an interview where you said, pay attention to the said and the unsaid. Yes. And like you said, there's so much in between. Yeah. And as a physician, I can totally relate to that because everything lies in, in that, you know, when you're taking the history, you can extract so much. I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, how did you incorporate this love of Urdu in your daughter? Because I feel like as a Pakistani American parent, as a lot of us in the audience here, it's a challenge to develop that love of poetry mm. for in our kids. And I've read about you know how your daughter was memorizing and reciting all these ghazals. And how did you do that? Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, she has a love of Urdu poetry, yes, but because she was not raised in that culture, mm -hmm. she can't have the context for many of those things. I mean, you can recite a line, Main to khelungi unhi se hori Yes, she can understand that, but the context of Main to khelungi unhi se. I mean, that whole thing is lost on, on a kid who's grown up here. So, while I did the same thing that I, right from the time she was little, I had her memorize poetry. And she did it very enthusiastically and happily because it gave us a very a positive half hour or so every morning where she knew how to please her mother. And her memory is very good, <laughs> much better than mine. So I had to just read a share a few times and she would recite it. Yes, she can do that. And in fact, this year on Mother's Day in this May, she as a hobby does pottery. So she made a vase for me on Mother's Day. And on the vase, she has inscribed, Wo firaq aur wo visal kaha. And then she took it from my book, the translation. Where are those separations, those unions? Where are those days, weeks, months, years? So I can't say that it's the exact same thing as someone who really has the context of, uh, of the culture, because it's all about the cultural uh, background also. Urdu is just, uh, to me, it's such a beautiful language because of what it is representing, the nuanced culture, the courtly culture. You know, aapko pata hai, Urdu sahi khushkhati mein likhne ke liye, katib ke pore, chhe chhe mahine halwe mein bandhe jate se. Ke pehle ungliyan naram ho jayen, kalam pakadne ke liye. Ye to humara culture hai. Aur ye kya culture hai? I love you, I love you too. <laughs> we can't compare the two. And divorce. And divorce. to jab ho, jab marriage ho, uski to vakti nahi aata. So, yeah, I think, uh, but I must say that because I made her memorize and because she always had a good time, doing it with me when she became an undergrad at Columbia University. She took a course in Urdu for heritage speakers on her own. 
and learned how to read and write very fluently on her own. So yes, there is some love of it. And of course, now that she's becoming a filmmaker, a lot of her storytelling abilities and script writing has this kind of, uh, of a background. You know, Pakistani girl growing up in New York kind of thing. And then all of this helps her a lot. So I think it was just having a good time with her doing it. And love is infectious in this way. She saw how much I am, the joy that I experienced reciting Urdu poetry or, you know, and, and the joy she felt of sudden comprehension when I would explain a share to her and she suddenly got it. That kind of happiness that comes with, oh, so that's what, oh. I think, it is, so it was just my uh, interaction with her was so positive over poetry that I think it got transmitted somewhere. Mm, I'm sure, I think in her um, filmmaking, because Urdu is such an expressive language. When I write something and I ask a friend to translate it, it's, it's a challenge, because you can't find those words. It doesn't have the same context in any other language as it does in Urdu. So I wanted to move towards your book, because I'm really, excited mm -hmm. about you reading maybe a passage or two for sure. us. Sure. Yeah, well, I thought I'll read this one passage. Ooh. Uh, can everyone hear me? No. Okay. The secret to success in life is relationships. The secret of relationships is trust. The secret of trust is acknowledgement of pure and simple truth. The problem in oncology, as in life, is that truth is rarely pure and never simple. One historic incident that has stayed with me since I first read about it as a teenager growing up in Karachi involves Mr. M. A. Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan. He spoke to a crowd of approximately 10,000 at a public gathering in Agra, India, in the early 1940s years before the partition of the subcontinent. Probably 500 people in that crowd had a passing knowledge of English, and about 50 of the elite among them understood it well. Trained as a barrister at Lincoln's Inn in London, Mr. Jinnah spoke in chaste English with a British accent for 40 minutes. And only in the last few did he address the commoners through a broken hybrid version of Urdu, Hindi, English. Shockingly enough, the crowd sat mesmerized throughout, despite a complete lack of understanding. <laughs> when asked afterwards about what captivated them to such a degree, one man's answer was, look, it's true that I did not understand a, a word of what Mr. Jinnah said in English. But I have full trust that whatever he said was for my good. <laughs> was the man's blind trust justified? Trust is not just the sugar-coated glaze. It is indispensable, essential, vital. Too much willingness to trust is naive, a leap of faith that can earn deception. Yet a deeply meaningful blind, blind trust is justified as long as the trustworthiness of the individual is established. The man's trust was based on an intelligent and experiential assessment of Mr. Jinnah's previous actions. Competence, reliability, his integrity, his demonstration of benevolence and empathy for the common man. Trust is not a static entity. It must be continually won. Mr. Jinnah had won it. Patients have the right to trust their physicians the same way. Mr. Jinnah was trusted by his constituency. The question I ask is, do we deserve the trust? In 1986, I had gone to Pakistan for a brief visit. One of my elderly female relatives at a family gathering, delighted to see me after several years, asked a curious question. I don't care how many degrees a doctor has, even if they are known to cure cancer, 
if they don't have the reputation of Shifa in their hands, I stay miles away from them. What I want to know is if you have been graced with Shifa in your hands. Shifa is an Urdu word loosely translated as the healing power. It is the equivalent of blind trust in one's doctor, a powerful, intangible confidence that no matter how deadly their health challenges, and especially when medical knowledge is stumped, the physician alone possesses the wisdom to remain sensitive, to proceed in caring, empathic ways, always exclusively focused on the patient's interest. Lady N, she was one of my patients that I'm writing about. Lady N thought I possessed Shifa. She expressed her confidence at least half a dozen times during every clinic visit. She trusted me with her life. I obsessively tally the number of ways in which I let her down. This terrified, trusting, vulnerable woman sitting in consultation across the room from me, her mind and body besieged from within and without, desperately seeking a lifeline I had no power to conjure. Lady and I both knew that she had a fatal illness, that it was simply a matter of time before she would enter the bedlam surrounding end-of-life issues. Obviously, I had no cure to offer, no magic bullet to eliminate the coming leukemia. And each time she expressed her implicit trust in the power of my Shifa, I reminded her gently of what was expected. She scoffed, she laughed it off, she changed the topic. Sometimes she became agitated, abruptly walked up and uh, got up and walked out. I broached the subject of involving our palliative care team, which she dismissed out of hand. What about a psychiatrist? I've been on antidepressants practically all my life. My mother thought I was hyper when I was two. I don't need more doping, thank you, Dr. Raza. Lady Anne simply refused to accept that the end could come for her. She demanded therapy for her cancer, not her mind, willing to be a guinea pig for any experimental approach I could, I could concoct. Was Lady Anne wrong in trusting me? Where is my Shifa? You won't believe that I wrote this book in three months. But my nephew Asad said to me, Achi, you have been writing this book for 30 years. You just downloaded it in three months. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true that all the patient experiences I've had, I couldn't have written this book when I was 30 years old, not because I have made some grand uh, discoveries, but because of the experience of walking thousands of patients during their terminal illnesses, taking care of them for years and years. And that's the kind of thing which brings you uh, a know-how that nothing else can. And yet I was not able to uh, convey to the people that the only way to really cure this deadly disease cancer is not to try and chase down once the disease has become end stage, but try to find it early. I mean, it makes total sense, doesn't it? Anytime we diagnose cancer on someone, the only good news we can give them is, oh, it's diagnosed early, it's in early stage. Well, then why don't we find it in an early stage? And stage one is not early enough because even for stage one, you need slash, poison, or burn. Surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation therapy, you still need those horrible treatments. Why not find it earlier than stage one, the first cell level? So this is just one of my assaults on the field. I'm always going around writing about it, so many articles before the book asking for the same thing, that early detection and prevention is the right thing to do. And so in the book I decided, why not look at every question related to cancer from the prison of human anguish? 
what are we doing to patients? Why not do that? And this is what I have done in the book. Every single thing related to cancer, I have looked at it from the perspective of a patient. Chapter 1, Umar, 38 year old, one of my dearest friends, Nahid Asfar's son. Oxford, Columbia educated, doing so well and suddenly he is diagnosed with a sar uh, uh, osteogenic sarcoma. From the moment of his diagnosis, every oncologist knows he is going to die. Nothing we do is going to prolong his illness. But what do we do? Amputate this, cut that, two times he has one right lung, half the lung removed, half of left lung removed, constantly surgeries ready, seven surgeries, major surgeries. No sooner does he recover from one, he has a tumor pop up somewhere, we are taking him back. Chemotherapy, radiation therapy, experimental therapy, immune therapy. All of these things, what is going on, why? So this is why I wrote the book, this was the inspiration to me always is the patient. What are we doing with the patient and how can we do better? Is there um, any Urdu piece that's your favorite? It could be Ghalib, it could be another one that you would not mind reciting for us. Meaning? Any Urdu poetry, like Ghazal, that you can recite? Um. I think let's open it to the audience. Maybe they want to hear something okay. from me. <laughs> then I can do that. Talk about Ghalib. Ghalib wanted to give his entire divan on one share, right? Gee, moment. Tum mere paas hote ho goya. Could you take a shot at that? Gee? What is coming to your mind right now? Could you? I'll do a moment share for you. You know, once moment ki ek aur share hai, bahut khubsurat. You know that ghazal, tu kaha jayegi, kuch apna thikana kar le, hum to kal khwab e adam me shab e hijra honge, phir bahar aai, wohi dasht navardi hogi, phir wohi paon, wohi khar e mughila honge. Then he comes to this uh, makta, which is Umr sari to kati, ishq e buta me momin. Umr sari to kati, ishq e buta me momin. Akhri vakt me kya khak musalma honge. <laughs> so I read this ghazal in front of my father, who was from Lucknow. He said, ha, acha hai, lekin Delhi ki zaban me hai. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, bhai, isi maayne ko humare ustad be khud laknavi ne laknav ki zaban me likha hai. Ji, irshad. Be khud mohani, same meaning. Moment's share is, umr sari to kati, ishq e buta me moment, aakhri wakt me kya khak musalma honge. Be khud mohani, مرتے مرتے بھی کہا یہ میرے کافر دل نے اب کافر مصرہ اولا میں آ گیا تو مصرہ ثانی میں مسلمان آنا ضروری ہے مرتے مرتے بھی کہا یہ میرے کافر دل نے آج کی اور صحیح کل سے مسلمان ہوں گے اوہ بائی دو وید انہیں شیئر ان دس غزل ہے آم پھر بہار آئی وہی دشت نوردی ہوگی یعنی بہار آئی ہے ہم پھر بہار means you know the spring is here which means the lovers should be meeting instead my beloved I cannot reach so you know وہ جنون کا عالم پاگلوں کی طرح بھاگتے پھریں گے ہم پھر بہار آئی وہی دشت نوردی ہوگی پھر وہی پاؤں وہی خار مغیلہ ہوں گے سو خار means of course کانٹے that's easy مغیلہ I wasn't sure the meaning of مغیلہ when you look it up کہ ببول کے کانٹے جو بہت تیز ہوتے ہیں ببول ایک درخت ہے انڈیا میں بہت ہوتا ہے 
تو اردو کی ایک پروفیسر ہمارے پاس ٹھہری میں تھی نیو یورک میں تو آئی آسٹر کہ اس کا کیا مطلب ہے انہوں نے کہا ہاں اس کا مطلب یہی ہے کہ بہت تیز کانٹے ببول کے آئی واز ان سیٹسفائڈ اینڈ دس از دا بیوٹی آئی کو جسٹ کال اپ مائی ڈیڈ ان پاکستان آئی کال اپ مائی فادر ان کراچی اینڈ آئی سیٹ کہ اس کا مطلب کیا ہے مغیلا کیوں کہا ہے ببول کے کانٹوں کو مائی فادر انسٹنٹلی سیٹ ہاں مغیلا نکلا ہے غول سے ایک زمانے میں یہ خیال تھا کہ بھوت پریت کے چڑیلوں پریوں اور بھوتوں کے غول کے غول آ کے ببول کے درخت پہ بیٹھتے تھے تو اس سے مغیلا غول سے مغیلا نکلا ہے کہ مطلب وہ درخت جس پہ وہ غول آ کے بیٹھتے ہیں جس کے کانٹے بہت تیز ہوتے ہیں خارے مغیلا یو سی ہاؤ دی ایٹمالوجی آف دا ورلڈ دا ہول انٹائر کانٹیکسٹ اینڈ بیک گراؤنڈ آئی مین دیٹس دا کائنڈ آف ایجوکیشن مائی ڈیڈ ہیڈ ان کو آپ اس شعر سے نہیں امپریس کر سکتے تھے مومن کے کی غزل سے بیکاز یو سے نہیں یہ تو دہلی کی زبان ہے گرد میں صحرا میرے پیچھے ہاؤ ڈو انٹرپریٹ اٹ آئی ایم گوئنگ ٹو ریڈ یو بیکاز آئی کوٹ دس شیر سو ٹو مدرس ان دس بک چیپٹر ون عمر اینڈ عمرز مدر ناہید and chapter 6 andrew 22 year old best friend of my daughter not her boyfriend her best friend since they're growing up he dies at 20 22 he's diagnosed at 23 he dies of a horrible brain tumor so his mother elena my best one of my dearest friends so, nahid elena some sorrows are unfathomable language incapable of expressing them What combination of letters could possibly speak the unspoken thoughts of mothers Nahid and Elena as they bid unhurried farewells to the serially dying parts of the creatures they had birthed and nurtured for decades? The anguish has no beginning and no end, no relief, no ascent or descent, no respite. collapsing past, present and future into one bottomless pit. I don't want to read the whole thing, but one spark of pain in the hearts of these mothers eclipses the glory of the sun. Dust raised by their ag- agitation conceals deserts. Their tears forcing a river to recede, dragging its forehead obsessively in front of their grief. Hota hai neha gard mein, sehra mere piche, aur ghista hai jabhi khak pe, darya mere aage. Next to me, the wilderness is shamed into hiding in dust. The servile river grovels in the dust before me. So I compare this... to the anguish of a mother who has lost a young son. Ghista hai jabhi khak pe tari. Doctor, you said something about shifa and that the shifa is almost a gifted thing rather than anything else. And I totally and 200% agree with you. I had experience that in a couple of years ago, my wife was very sick. Cirrhosis, liver cirrhosis, okay? And we had given up, the doctors in Pakistan told me that she's got 60 days to live, do what you like. My <coughs> children were here and they cried, Baba, you've got to bring them here, you do something. And of all the things, when we brought her here, there was one doctor, a great doctor, whom I admire for a long time now, Dr. Dilal, sitting right here. <laughs> okay, he took a case. He took a case, he was in Saudi Arabia at that time, And when he came to, to San Francisco here, he took this case, and then when I talked to him, he and, you know, 
He said, don't worry, we'll do something about it, and it should be all right. And that's this trip up that we did. Now, I'm talking of 10, 15 years ago, and there she's sitting. Wow. That's the duty of Chifa, which God gives. That's Nobody right. else does. Nobody. Yes. You know? Beautiful. Another doctor's given up. He's already set maximum 60 days. And here he is in a couple of years, 10, 15 years ago. Beautiful <laughs> story. Mubarak. Beautiful. Wonderful. <laughs> I don't have a question. I think we're not, we are, I think we're not in a Q&A session, but it seems like it's a... Yeah, I think this is Q&A. This is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a question. Uh, these are two comments, but I would like speak to... Up for that. Speak up. Yeah. Okay, I'll just speak up. Yeah. yeah. So I don't have a question, Dr. Rajan, but I just have a few comments. Um, so first of all, I would like to touch upon the topic of uh, or the concept of empathy that you touched upon. And, uh, it really takes the next step to feel somebody's pain and to put yourself in their shoes. Very The second comment I have is about your um, the passage that you read from your book about trust and it's Beautifully <coughs> written. Um, my take, or my humble just sense, uh, or comment rather on that is that I think trust is intertwined with reliance. And when trust and reliance are both present, that's when trust takes the form of blind trust. So that's just a quick thing that I want Beautiful. And the last thing I would like to comment on is on sorrow, because we read the last chapter. I feel like that sorrow plays such a deep role, such, such an integral role in poetry. Like, for instance, Khalif, his poetry is very well, a lot of it is constructed around the sorrow, around the fall of Dhaka, because we took it to heart. Or in other parts of the poetry are either for the love or the sorrow to meet the divine and to search for, for the eternal um, divinity. Sometimes it's for worthy love, but most of the time it's for the urge to go back and let get united with the one. I just wanted to share those thoughts. And if you have anything to ask Thank you so much. I think uh, all your thoughts are spot on. I had looked up a YouTube video of yours before, um, and during your talk, you oh, my name is Raza Salam, sorry. <laughs> um, and you had said that the Urdu we speak today is actually not due to Mira Taqi Mir or Ghalib, it's actually due to Anis. And um, since we were talking about sorrow, I just wanted to know if you could recite some of these for us, whatever was coming to your mind. Um, <clears throat> my problem in reciting Anis is I'll start crying. <laughs> it's very hard to control myself. <laughs> uh, but you know, uh, because Reza, you've asked such a nice question. Um, uh, Shibli Nomani compares Anis and the Beer. And uh, he gave one share in comparison where he says, hands down, Anis is uh, absolutely, he wins way too easily. So I'll just recite that one share for you because I know I won't break down with that probably. Um, so it's uh, the apocryph, um, not apocryph, the historical uh, account is that uh, after the Imam has. Uh, pushed the forces on Rose Ashur and is now resting for a few minutes because the enemy retreated. Yazid's forces retreated. So he's just resting for a few minutes. And a passerby says, what is going on? He asks Hussein, what is going on? And so he just says, this is Yazid's forces and they are here uh, for the Ali Muhammad, peace be upon him. So the man says, but then who are you? 
and uh, the way Shibli uh, says that the beer introduces uh, something like uh, Farmaya Me Hussain uh, Alayhi Salam or something like that. But then Anis, who is a a real psychiatrist goes deeper into the incident and he says that while this conversation was going on the Imam felt that this man is sympathetic to his cause rather than to Yazid and so in a the Beer has said something like Farmaya me Hussain alayhi salam hu Whereas Anis brings in, Ye to na keh sake ke shahe mashrakain hu. Mawla ne sar juka ke kaha, Main Hussain hu. What a beautiful way of. Ye to na, because shahe mashrakain was a title given to Hussain by his grandfather. Nobody knows why. But he is called Shahe Mashrakain. Ye to na keh sake ke Shahe Mashrakain hu. Mawla ne sar juka ke kaha, main Hussain hu. And here's a Dabir for you. Dabir's language, so beautiful. Nakash o naqsh katib o khat bani o bana. Budo nabood zat o sifat hasti o fana. Adam Malak, Zameen O Falak, Gard O Kimiya, Dunia O Deen, Hudus O Qidam, Banda O Khuda. Now what can you do with this? Dunia O Deen, Hudus O Qidam, Banda O Khuda. Sab Shahide Kamale Shahe Mashrakain Hai. Shahid is a witness. On Rose Ashur, all of these things that I just mentioned are a witness to what has happened. You know the last words that have been recorded on Rose Ashur that Imam Hussain said are, Maine apna vada pura kiya, ab tu apna vada pura kar. In a way, he's in conversation with his God. And so people have often wondered, what is that conversation? And the Beer's interpretation is, this is the conversation. Sab shahide kamale shahe mashrakain hain, jab tak khuda ka mulk hai, Malik Hussain hain. This is the beer. Yes. Uh, two questions. What, because we are in Silicon Valley, I am really interested. How did you find your co-author? How was that journey? Did she, because she wrote the book. She's you. my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Telling the idea, like getting her as interested in your interest. How was that journey? We struggle with this here, how to build teams, how to how to get people to fall in line with your passion. How was that journey? That's a very good question because I had been wanting to do this book myself, but I felt like I needed um, so Sara Suleri was my Zede Suleri's daughter was a dear friend and when I met her I said that you are uh, she's half Welsh and half uh, Pakistani. So, and professor of English at Yale. So, her sensibility is a Western sensibility because she grew up, her childhood was all in Wales. But then she spent time in Lahore. So, her sensibility is both Western but then steeped in because she's very insightful, of course. She's of all the people I've ever met in my life, and I know Nobel laureates and all kinds of amazing people here. I have never met, Sara is here and the rest of us are down here. She is, she was, she died two year, just a year ago. But what a, I mean that intellect comes once in centuries. The kind of, she got it, she gets it. And she really, so I knew that in ki Urdu to thodi barik hai. But if I can explain ke bhai ghalib ka ye kaha hai unho ne. And now, 
uh, then we would start talking about but really what does he what is he really saying and then she would bring her western sensibility and because I am steeped in the Lucknow Aligarh culture I would be able to know this is not what he's saying this is the context we would debate one share for days sometimes and then in the end she would sit back and say okay Azra now let me put this into difficult English <laughs> <laughs> and so, Epistemologies of Elegance, the book we wrote, is so in such difficult English that my friends complain, now we have to look up every word you guys have written. <laughs> we were supposed to be reading the interpretation. But the depth of uh, meaning in Ghalib is something that only she could do with me. And, and so, I think the partnership was very good because we complemented each other. And the people were together? Uh, yeah. Yeah, she, uh, her, no, so I was, I was at University of Massachusetts at the time and she was at Yale, New Haven, so it was a short distance and uh, her husband Austin Goodyear died, uh, so she had, you know, taken some time off. So she spent the sabbatical mostly living with me and that's when we did the book, day and night literally, that every spare moment I had, that's what we did. And one share, this is why we could only do 21 ghazals in basically two years. Good use of your <laughs> <laughs> You know, Khushwant Singh yeah. was sent our book for review, Ghalib Epistemologies of Elegance. He said, well, two ladies from Pakistan have written a book on Ghalib. The name epistemologies of elegance. I didn't know the meaning of epistemology. So I went and looked it up. It gave me heartburn. <laughs> but they have done a satisfactory job. <laughs> Yes, completely accurate. Being absolutely broke, as he mentioned, but yeah, still having this unbelievable. Always. And so insightful. I'm a huge wild fan. In fact, my, when my daughter was eight, I had made her memorize the entire ballad of Reading Jail, which is a beautiful thing. And I took her to Reading just to see, show her the cellar and everything. Um, let me give you one line which will sh prove to you that what your, your students and your, the young people are saying is very true. The refrain of the ballad of Reading Jail is, all men kill the things they love. And he wrote it while he was in jail. So his boyfriend, uh, Lord Alfred Douglas, Bosey, after he, was, uh, he came out of jail, asked him, what did you mean by saying all men kill the things they love? What does that mean? And first, Wilde tried to just diss him and not answer, but Bosey persisted. What does it mean, all men kill the things they love? You know, the answer he gave is so beautiful. Wilde said, look, when we meet someone, we make an impression of the person immediately in our minds. When we meet them again and again, they don't meet that exact impression we had. Now, instead of changing our impression, we try to change the person. That's how you kill them. <laughs> what, an in, what a gorgeous line. All men kill the things. I mean, the two people who are madly in love get married 10 years later, they can't stand each other. Why? Because they are not adjusting, not ch change, changing their impression. Rather, they are trying to change the other person constantly. And so I think all great writers in a way have the same kinds of insights, but what Wilde and Ghalib shared was this levity, this lightness, this sense of joy in everything. I think Mahmood has something to say. Yes, please. Thank you. 
मौजूद जो है शायरी और सिर्फ मैं उसके हवाले से कॉमेंट करना चाह रही थी कि हम लोग अमेरिका में हैं यहाँ पे जब कोई बीमार होता है तो वही बात होती है कि अपना कल्चर भी याद आता है लेकिन आपने जो भी बयान किया कि आपके पेशेंट्स आते हैं और आपको एंसिटी भी होती है और आप शायरी की तरफ मुलविस हो गए आपने सहारा लिया आप सोचती हैं कि यहाँ पे जो पाकिस्तान के या मुस्लिम पेशेंट्स हैं उनके लिए क्या ये थेरेपी सही रहेगी कि जैसे अमेरिकन सिस्टम है कि आप सपोर्ट ग्रुप में जाते हैं कैंसर अगर किसी को हो जाते हैं तो सपोर्ट ग्रुप होते हैं उसमें भी इसी किस्म की चीज़ें बताई जाती हैं कि आप पोइट्री ले लें आप जर्नल लिखें आप जाके थोड़ा सा आर्ट की तरफ जाएँ अपने इज्तेमाल को थोड़ा सा मसरूफ कर लें बीमारी से रखें आपको लगता है कि आप जो पोइट्री की बात करें तकलीफ उर्दू पोइट्री की ये कोई ऐसा तरीका हो सकता है कि अपने उर्दू स्पीकिंग पेशेंट्स के लिए एक प्रोग्राम हो जाए थोड़ा सा कि की जाए आई डोंट वॉन्ट शेयर दैट बिकॉज मैंने ग्यारह साल अपने हस्बैंड की शेयर की है वन थाउजेंडिंग अगर आप पोइट्री की तरफ मारे बजाय अपना जो भी टाइम गुजरता है कीमोथेरेपी और सर्जरी जी नहीं बिल्कुल बिल्कुल आपसे आई कम्प्लीटली एग्री विद यू that definitely you see i'm dealing with people who have let's say 3 months to live we know that or 6 months to live miraculously every now and then there is an anecdote like you just beautiful anecdote but generally doctors make a right guess that okay beyond a year this person won't live 90% chances at that time most young oncologists especially would become very anxious because it's they take it as a personal failure and my thing is that that's the time when you really have to step in to help the patient why because you see when there is hope you can think and plan for years ahead but when there is no hope then the here and now becomes very important yeah very right everything you do every gesture you make every relationship you have suddenly acquires an an aggravated importance and that's where you have to uh, my conversations with my patients are not everyone is as seduced by poetry as you and i for example everyone in this room is here because you love urdu poetry and poetry of some sort or the other but 99.9% people in this deeply unpoetic culture don't care about poetry but the important thing you know from poetry is that you can help them make every moment more precious and livable and celebrating life instead of worrying about death so i think uh, that's a universal kind of thing that can be applied to whether the person is coming from a cultural background that's pakistani or that is from fargo north dakota the same things our human values are the same but let me end by by quoting a meer sher kya ghazab ka sher hai i love this sher <laughs> he says dair se uthke kaabe aaya meer there is temple where you are uh, you know uh, praying to idols hmm. so ghalib is uh, meer is saying kya ghazab ka sher hai there se uthke kaabe aaya meer which means finally he has seen you know the light of day there se uthke kaabe aaya meer jisko chahe khuda kharab kare <laughs> meaning what does he what is he really saying ke dair se uthke kaabe aaya meer jisko chahe khuda kharab kare what he is saying is aashiqi se milega ae zahid hamare yahan zahid nasir mulla in sab ko bahut daant padti hai urdu mein 
आशकी से मिलेगा है जाहिद बंदगी से खुदा नहीं मिलता दिस इज एग्जैक्टली वॉट ही सेंग आशकी इज द मेन थिंग लेकिन उसके साथ साथ ये भी है कि आशकी में आपको क्या करना पड़ता है ओह हो सब कुछ देना पड़ता है होती नहीं है यूं ही अदा ये नमाज इश्क होती नहीं है यूं ही अदा ये नमाज इश्क यहां शर्त है कि अपने लहू से वजू करो दिस इज वॉट यू हैव टू गेट जुरत ना हो दिल में तो मोहब्बत नहीं मिलती यू नीड करेज टू लव इतना आसान नहीं है मजनू बनना और डू वी हैव टू मिनट्स आई वांट टू से वन एनेकडोट आई वाज जस्ट टॉकिंग टू राजा साहब ऑफ महमूदाबाद ही टोल्ड मी एन एनेकडोट जस्ट रिसेंटली कि लखनऊ में 1920s की बात है एक साहब थे यंग मैन हु सॉ अ गर्ल पासिंग एंड फेल इन लव विद हर अब वो रोज कॉलेज जाती थी वहां से ये खड़े होके उसे देखते थे एंड देन इन्होंने क्या करना शुरू किया जब वो गुजरती थी उस पर एक कंकर फेंकते थे एक दिन उसने मुड़ के कह दिया और अगर लग जाता हो 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 उस दिन से ये पागल हो गए लेकिन विद इन डेज दैट गर्ल गॉट मैरिड और उसने गुजरना छोड़ दिया तो अब ये गलियों गलियों बस ये कहते फिरते थे और अगर लग जाता और अगर लग जाता तो वन ऑफ हर फ्रेंड्स वन डे सेट टू हर के भाई एक आदमी है पागल वो इस तरह फिरता है ये कहता हुआ शी सेट अच्छा तुम मुझे दिखा सकती हो वो कौन है उसने कहा हाँ यहाँ से गुजरेगा मेरे घर आ जाना वो गई देखने When she saw out of the window, she saw the same man going and saying, "Or agar lag jata, or agar lag jata." Seeing him and hearing that, she fell and died. So, now Raja Sahab asked me the question. He said, "Ye bataiye ki sacha aashik wo tha jo pagal ho gaya ya ye jo mar gayi." जुरत ना हो दिल में तो मोहब्बत नहीं मिलती खैरात में इतनी बड़ी दौलत नहीं मिलती नजारे को तो जुम बिशे मिशगा भी बार है ओह गॉड फॉर मेहदी द वर्ड मिशगा नजारे को तो जुम बिशे मिशगा वेन योर आई साइट इज लॉक्ड विद योर ऑब्जेक्ट ऑफ डिजायर देन इवन द ब्लिंकिंग ऑफ एन आई लिड इज एनोइंग नजारे को तो जुम बिशे मिशगा भी बार है नरगिस की आंख से तुझे देखा करे कोई नरगिस इज अ फ्लॉ दैट हैज एग्जैक्टली लाइक एन आई बट इट नेवर ब्लिंक्स नरगिस की आंख से तुझे देखा करे कोई मीनिंग इट हैज टू बी एन अनब्लिंकिंग आई यस that's a very good and a very important question you know a um, friend of mine just uh, produced a play called mughle azam has anyone seen it yes. wow 
Isn't that an amazing play? Yes. Stunning. What a great job he did. Excellent. Feroz Khan, dear friend of mine. Uski khatir hum dekhne gaye, waise to I thought ki nothing can be better than the film. But the play is so good. Kamal Amrubi ke dialogues to khair bohi hain, but amazing play. But what I saw was there were like four Pakistanis and 10,000 Indians, Hindus mostly. And yet they were so beautifully moved by this whole love story. And I mean, think of all the Hindu Muslim tensions going on in India. Nobody could guess at all that there is any tension between Hindu Muslims in that room, the way they were appreciating culture. And it occurred to me at that moment, a question I had been asking my parents before, that we have so many legendary lovers in, uh, in our culture. Sasi Pannu hai, Shireen Farhad, Laila Majnu, uh, Soni Mahiwal, kaun kitne legends aap kar sakte? Heer Ranja, exactly. Uh, koi Hindu legend nahi hai. No legendary love. But that doesn't mean that they don't have the love, they don't feel it. It's just that they haven't written about it because it's just not in their cultural background. So people have different ways of expressing. And you can't compare one to the other. That is a, that is a rel religious story. Sorry to say, it is not a real thing. Do you want to say something? Yes, of course, but I just want to finish my thought for you. So the idea is, not, I'm not saying that they have any different feelings than us, no. But their expression is in more in classical music, for example. Unka kya kamal hai? You can't question that. Lekin hamara us mein nahi, hamara ghazal mein hai. So everyone has their way of expressing their cultural uh, traditions. And so to me, because I'm seeped in the Urdu background, and I appreciate it more, I'm sure that uh, uh, there are greater poetry traditions in other languages. I just don't know them. So I wouldn't want to, to say what is special about our culture, uh, our poetry. I say what's special about Urdu poetry is the kind of uh, themes that we have addressed, that our poets have addressed, are the same themes that every great writer exists. Number one, the asrar e azal. Why are we here? Who are we? Who created us? Where are we going? What does life mean? These are the existential angst type of questions that every great writer or thinker is addressing. And this is what has been done so beautifully in our poetry. Uh, I mean, honestly, I read a lot of English poetry and I love it and I have memorized tons of things. The entire 33rd canto from Dante's Paradiso I can recite. Yet I don't have that cultural background. My cultural background is Sabzao gul kaha se aaye hain, abr kya cheez hai, hawa kya hai. I mean, just to be asking these questions. So I feel we, we are so lucky to have to be born in this tradition. We are so privileged, so fortunate. Magar wohi problem hai. Sar sari tum jahan se guzre, varna har ja jahan e digar tha. Well, uh, the, the, I have to answer your question about the Sufi idea. I think one um, of Amir Khusro's things should answer this Sufi idea. The whole concept of the Sufi tradition is welcome affliction. Suffering is very much a part of our being and suffering is fine, especially if you are doing it for love. That is the Sufi tradition, ishq or husn, that's our tradition of Sufi uh, culture. And <laughs> Uh, regarding uh, quoting Hazrat Bilal 
हाउ ब्यूटिफुल रीड द होल थिंग अगेन क्या बात क्या बात क्या बात है शाबाश ब्यूटिफुल शेर हाउ ब्यूटिफुल वाह 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 शाबाश I don't know. Good question. Well, you know, I have been fascinated by intellectually by the question of cancer because as a teenager, I read a book in which it said something like, "If you imagine the body is a state and the cells are its citizens, citizens have to stay and follow some rules, and one of the rules is that citizens citizens have to stay home in the organ in which they are born. Liver cells must stay in the liver." ovarian cells in the ovaries lung cells in the lungs only in one condition they walk out that's cancer and i found that fascinating how is it that they develop this mobility to walk out and the second thing was that uh, we in our bodies give birth to a new species that can live forever so as a teenager these are the two questions that fascinated me if i can unlock the secret of a cancer cell that can live forever i can unlock the secret of immortality and second how do cells develop mobility as a cancer uh, phenotype and that was an intellectual challenge and i was already obsessed with wanting to study cancer but then at dow medical college I saw my first cancer patients and Bilal the problem going to Dow is at least in my time in the 70s was that patients only came when they had end stage disease fungating masses big horrifying tumors 32 year old with a sarcoma that is smelling so bad from the next building you can say that there is a cancer patient that kind of thing you never see here that's where the first cancer patient i saw i knew that now i have an emotional investment for which is the the necessary thing for a quest of life an intellectual challenge is never enough your heart has to be in it and so dao gave me that dard e dil building up going you prefer calling your dad having the old rule back now um, a little bit would be interested in on your mom side as well but the medicine also came from family or like parents or were they doing something else and that's curious like how would you characterize your influence by both your parents medicine came Uh, so in my family my father was in the foreign service and my mother was a sharif zadi never <laughs> it was below her dignity to work or think of it um but my grandmother was a hakim and many of my mom uh, my father's mamus were hakims so and my mother's sister went and to tibbia college and studied hikmat my god you see how lovely how beautiful well so there was all that tradition but i was never exposed to it uh for us the growing up in pakistan there weren't that many things you could do uh, because uh, president ayub khan decided that liberal arts uh, education is not useful for a young country we should only do teach our young people skills so they should be doctors engineers or lawyers mainly 
those were the three things open to you. Now, I was always a seriously curious person who uh, my first love was ants, just study of ants, myrmecology. And so uh, for me, the only entry into science was study medicine. It wasn't that we had molecular biology, PhDs, graduate work available. So it was, I think a lot of it is that we didn't have that many choices. But then um, four, of my, four of us siblings are all physicians in the family. And um, it, can't, it could be that uh, the siblings influenced each other, but I would again say that it's hard to tell when you don't have that many options. Yes. liberal arts, everything, and we have compartmentalized education, which is my view, unnecessarily. I always go to Leonardo da Vinci, who studied everything. We can't say science, art, this, that. Everything is needed. You have gone to your art of choice, poetry, which balances this really difficult job you had. I have a lot of respect for Dr. Sukhas, they see people at their worst. I, as an educator, I see people growing and learning. It's all positive, it's all good. When my students are presidents, whatever, I think I had a part in it, you know. So yes. that is, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you have both. One thing, you, you're right about different cultures have different themes, but I am a great believer in poetry of missing. Punjabi, Urdu, English, Spanish, you name it. Yes. The experience a mystic has, I believe, is a human experience. Doesn't matter if you're Catholic or Muslim or Hindu or of course. it has no difference. So if anybody's looking for something that is comparable in poetry, I think mystic poetry is yes. it. Um, but my question is, is there a young Urdu poet, or not young, even old, of the 21st century that you know of that reflects in their language? I mean, we know Ghadir wrote for his time, we know Iqbal wrote for his time, and they are such beautiful reflections of the time and also of general human experience. So they are for all times and also for that time. Is there somebody in the 21st century who is writing for our time, Urdu, English, whatever language? Go ahead, answer. I'm trying to write for our time. And when you were talking about um, cancer patients, I'm not an oncologist, I'm a hospitalist, but I do night calls. And when I'm taking care of patients who are on comfort care, palliative care, end of life, and I have not taken care of them for years. So it's, it's a complete contrast to your journey of taking care of somebody and walking with them. I just meet them minutes before they die and sometimes after they have passed away. So I've written an Urdu poem. Um, the title is in English. It's called Time of Death, 11.05 PM. I'll be happy to share that with you, which talks about Well, read it do. now. It will make everybody cry. So. <laughs> <laughs> Why, why are we here? <laughs> okay, I will read it, and then that we will uh, conclude the evening on that because. Um, you have to conclude on time of life. While you're while you're looking for that, can I ask a question? Uh, actually, wait. I'd like to address something you said. You said mystical poetry is the most important if anyone wants to connect. No, no I didn't say it's important. I'm saying that if somebody's looking for something that carries across I see. Uh, cultures, mm -hmm. like we, we talk about sort of the romance of Urdu poetry, but mystical poetry seems to cross all boundaries. There's nothing, mm -hmm. um, you know. Like that's what I don't agree with. I think it's erotic poetry that crosses the boundaries too. The love that you feel for another individual is just as deep and as universal. That's what I, my point is, it's not just mystical, but any kind of love. 
that's what uh, what poetry really defines as for young poet somebody asked me about uh, uh, let me just while you're looking um, i think uh, i'll just read two shares they're so beautiful written by young younger poets nowadays ek bachche ne kya sheer likha 18 19 saal ki umar i don't even know his name chalo main zindagi bhi kaat lunga मतलब जिंदगी काटना क्या मुश्किल चीज चलो मैं जिंदगी भी काट लूंगा अगर ये आज का दिन कट गया तो चलो मैं जिंदगी भी काट लूंगा अगर ये आज का दिन कट गया तो एंड देन अनदर शेयर बाय माय ग्रेट फ्रेंड इफ्ती नसीम हु रोट इट एज अ यंग पर्सन आल्सो यू नो गजल हैज अ रियल ट्रेडिशन he stays in the tradition and he breaks every rule of the tradition he brings in a submarine into a ghazal submarine aap dos kishti you know submarine that is submerged in the sea kati hai umr kisi aap dos kishti mein i have spent my life in a submarine कटी है उम्र किसी आप दोज किश्ती में सफर तमाम हुआ और कुछ नहीं देखा दिस इज अ मॉडर्न पोएट ब्रिंगिंग सब मेरीन इन टू अ गजल ट्रेडिशन एंड सेइंग समथिंग सो प्रोफाउंड सो आई थिंक दे इज अ गोल्डन पीरियड ऑन उर्दू I think Urdu is very much alive. Anyone writing epitaphs of Urdu, go read some of the modern poets and listen to Ifra. So this poem I wrote um, after spending several night calls um, pronouncing patients when they expire. Gangur Sanata, Urzor Sanata, Gunch Tahua, Chikh Tahua. खामोश सन्नाटा बंद धड़कन बेहिस रूह दो हैरान आंखें जर्द परेशान आंखें और मैं सांस लेती हुई तेजी से दौड़ती हुई एक मेरी धड़कन और एक मौत रात के पिछले पहर में उस तारीख कमरे में मुझसे कुछ पूछती हुई वो सर्द घड़ी वक्त की भीख मांगती हुई वो हैरान आंखें मेरी रूह को चीरती हुई वो गुमनाम आंखें अलविदा कहती हुई थकन से चूर जिंदगी से हारती हुई वो मायूस घड़ी और मैं अपने वाइट कोट को ढाल बनाए जज्बात की लौ दिल में दबाए माजी के जख्मों पर मरहम लगाए कमरे से निकलते मेरी लर्जा कदम और मैं और फिर उस अनजान मुसाफिर के अफसाना हयात पर तकनीक की मोहर लगाते हुए कागज पर दस्तखत करते हुए मेरे कांपते हाथ और फिर बजाहिर बेनियाजी से पलट कर नर्स से ये कह कर जाती हुई मैं टाइम ऑफ डेथ इलेवन ओ फाइव वाह बहुत खूब शाबाश कंक्लूजन तो आप पे होगा नहीं नहीं लास्ट मैसेज नहीं अब आप एक उनको कहने दीजिए वो कुछ कहना चाह रहे हैं This is right. This is our long-time Silicon Valley 
senior, senior, <laughs> senior than me, <laughs> citizen. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 he's, he's been here longer than I have. If you <laughs> sorry, so. We haven't touched on the mischievous side of Bali. G. कल वो जाता था कि वायस को मैखाने से जी or even more than that, he makes fun constantly of poor Moses. Kya farz hai ke sab ko mile ek sa jawab? Aao na hum bhi sair karein kohe tur ki. Sair karein. Beautiful. Can you interpret that? Ke kal ko jata tha ke hum. Haan, bilkul. Thank you everybody for coming.